Hi, welcome to History Respond. I'm your host, Bob Whitaker. Today's episode studies Assassin's Creed Origins, which is set in ancient Egypt. The game follows a magi by the name of Bayek, who seeks revenge against a shadowy organization known as the Order of the Ancients. Bayek's quest occurs against the familiar backdrop of the Ptolemaic era, and finds the player character brushing shoulders with the likes of Cleopatra and Julius Caesar. In addition to the historical figures of the game, players can climb and enter pyramids and visit the ancient cities of Alexandria and Memphis. My scholarly expert for this episode is Peter Manuelen, who is the Philip J. King Professor of Egyptology at Harvard University and the director of the Harvard Semitic Museum. Peter's expertise is in ancient Egyptian history, archaeology, and architecture, specifically the mortuary architecture of the Giza Plateau. He is also the director of the Giza Project at Harvard, a national endowment for the humanities funded project that builds 3D virtual reconstructions of the Giza pyramids and the surrounding cemeteries. Peter, welcome to the show. Thanks very much. Pleasure to be with you. So, Peter, this game is set near the end of the Ptolemaic period in Egypt. Could you give us a brief background on this era of history? And could you tell us what makes this era of history different from previous eras of Egyptian history? Mm, Great question. Well, I think from the Assassin's Creed standpoint, it was probably a pretty smart move because if you set your plots at the tail end of Egyptian pharaonic history, then you've got all of the monuments and periods behind you and Mm -hmm. experience them. If they had set it, say, in the Pyramid Age, like 2500 BCE, then uh, obviously many things would not have been built and wouldn't exist yet. You couldn't experience them. So this is the tail end of uh, Egyptian pharaonic history. Uh, Pharaonic history is usually thought to have about 30 dynasties or so. And in 332 BC, that is when Alexander the Great comes in and conquers Egypt. He has a few successors, and then what's called the Ptolemaic dynasty starts after that, with Ptolemies going from 1 all the way up into 13, 14, and even 15. So this is a very different era. Um, Egypt is not being controlled by its own native sons at this point and won't be all the way until 1952 when the revolution comes and uh, Kamal Abdel Nasser is eventually in in control of the country. So you have the native Egyptian population and then this kind of Macedonian Greco-Roman overlay Mm -hmm. governing from Alexandria in the north. And I think it was a fairly tense relationship at times and at other times it functioned uh, a lot better. So this is a very different flavor from the areas that I focus on. I'm back in the Old Kingdom or the New Kingdom, and uh, we don't have this kind of uh, foreign control and overlay of uh, another Mediterranean culture. Mm. So the game's narrative, it follows the familiar story of Cleopatra, her brother Ptolemy, on the beginning of Roman rule in Egypt. And, you know, it's a story that's been adapted by everybody from Shakespeare to the sword and sandal films of the 50s and 60s. Uh, to more recent television productions such as HBO's Rome. Uh, What is it about this story that makes it such a popular basis for historical drama? And to what extent do you think the attention on this story obscures or distorts other elements of the Egyptian past? Hmm. Well, when I start teaching my survey courses, I usually assume that one of about four or five things brought the students in to the course in the first place. And it's usually pyramids or mummies or King Tut, or Cleopatra. Mm -hmm. There are a few others in there too, but um, those are the biggies. And she has somehow with her Eastern exoticism caught the imagination, whether some have preferred to see in her some kind of femme fatale or brilliant beauty or others a shrewd politician. Um, That has somehow captured the imagination. Of course, she's been immortalized in uh, so many plays and Hollywood movies that keeps her going in the public consciousness as well. And it's also a period where we have enough written sources so we can actually talk about some personalities. That's something that's missing from an awful lot of Egyptian history. We have kings who built tremendous monuments and issued edicts and decrees and things, but very seldom can you actually say this was a nice guy. This was a forward-thinking politician. This is someone who reorganized the, uh, you know, the districts of the land and made great use of agricultural innovations and things. That's tough. When you get down to these known figures of Cleopatra and Caesar and Antony, we have uh, meat on the bones, I suppose is the way you could, you could put it. Mm-hmm. 
And how do you go about, I mean, just speaking about previous eras of Egyptian history, I mean, how do you go about trying to reconstruct the individualism, the personalities of the past? Is there any way that you can do that from the archaeological record, for instance? Well, we try to read between the lines anytime we can. And I think the smart move is to try to use all the source material that's available. So some people will prefer to read the hieroglyphic inscriptions and say, this is what the Egyptians are telling us. This is where I get my source material. And the field archaeologist might say, well, there's a lot of propaganda in there and you can't believe what they're telling you. You've got to read between the lines. This is what they want you to believe. And ground truth is really in the archaeology. It can't lie in the same sense that uh, a text can. On the other hand, uh, a, found, a mud brick foundation of a house or something isn't going to tell you necessarily about the divorce of the two people or one of them uh, had a child who died young or someone else rose up through the ranks to achieve great uh, administrative uh, prowess or something like that. So you have to put these things together and uh, do the best you can. And sometimes the evidence is there and more often it is not or it's fragmentary. Someone has sealed this room. The smell of the blood I spilled still lingers here. A mummified heron. A resurrection. No. Whoever did this must have known of Rudjek's place in the Order. Rudjek does not deserve a tomb. But this is an insult. This tomb was made for a pharaoh. Whoever did this has defiled this place. Uh, so a major element of Assassin's Creed Origins is cultural imperialism. Uh, and in particular, the protagonist Bayek often rages against the Greek and Roman intrusions on ancient domestic Egyptian culture and religion. And there's a real sense in the game that Egyptian history and society is under assault and that it's up to the player to resist Greco-Roman norms. Is there any truth to this narrative of cultural confrontation in the Ptolemaic period? I think absolutely. I think there were large segments of the Egyptian population that never quite accepted as legitimate the Ptolemaic dynasty. And when you have various uh, omens like eclipses or low Niles that lead to bad inundations and crop failure, that doesn't do well for people believing in the legitimacy of the ruling house up there in Alexandria. Cleopatra was a bit of a special case. When she is first coming to power, there were some low Niles and people were not so happy with her. Later on, she turned things around a little bit um, with some intelligence, and one of them was learning the native language, and I think that endeared her to the population. And then by cunningly organizing this uh, detente with Rome, and first with Caesar and later with Antony, for periods at least, she was able to keep things stable and keep things prosperous. And there are certain Ptolemies who actually presided over a larger Egyptian empire than other times in Egyptian dynastic history. So the Ptolemaic period is not one completely of decline and neglect and all of that. But there definitely was, I think, occasional friction. And uh, as always, the smart invaders and conquerors and rulers in Egypt, when they adopt some form of Egyptian customs, whether that's to build a temple in Egyptian style, as many Roman emperors did, or to offer before some oracle, such as out at Siwa Oasis, or do other things that will endear them to local traditions and, um, and motifs. I think that's always a plus for uh, uh, you know gaining a little bit of trust on the part of the local Egyptians. Mm -hmm. In the game, for instance, there's a, many people, many advisors to Cleopatra who are telling her to be more like Alexander the Great in the sense that they say that uh, he was a Macedon who came to Egypt and became an Egyptian. Uh, and I don't know if there's any truth to that, but I, again, I think you know what you're saying is true. That uh, there is this thinking, at least in the game, that in order to rule Egypt, in order to understand its people, you've got to to make the effort and not simply uh, put over your own civilization, your own thinking mm -hmm. on top of that existing structure. I think that's accurate, and you could probably say the Ptolemies wouldn't have had the military forces to sort of oppress the entire Nile Valley <laughs> all the way up into the Sudan to do that. So it makes a lot more sense to uh, to try to rule from within and adopt what customs and cultures you can, and you know, not just see the whole country as Rome's breadbasket to be exploited. And right. The best of that political situation, and for a while it worked fairly well, and then at times it came crashing down, such as at the end of Cleopatra's time. Mm. So speaking of cultural confrontation, there's been a sustained attack 
on Assassin's Creed Origins uh, for centering the story on black characters, uh, leading a lot of racist internet trolls to claim that the game blackwashes history. Uh, but there's been several attempts on the other side, uh, most notably on Reddit, to defend the game and set the record straight using scholarly work. Uh, and this issue, of course, comes on the heels of whitewashing claims against recent films, including Exodus and Gods of Egypt. And I'm wondering, what do you make of the fact that ancient Egypt is often used as a battleground for modern fights over race and ethnicity? Mm, it's a great question. And I always say in class that archaeology doesn't exist in a vacuum and people are interpreting things uh, along with their own biases and often agendas, hidden or not hidden. And it's a difficult issue. I find all the trolling most unfortunate on both sides. And I think if you had to make accusations of whitewashing versus blackwashing, there's an awful lot more whitewashing going on in the world in terms of acting roles and uh, you know, recognition of uh, some of the great contributions of black African civilizations have made. Even some of the archae early archaeologists couldn't quite wrap their heads around the fact that, yes, these were black African civilizations in Nubia, in modern Sudan, for example, building these tremendous monuments and creating these amazing crafts and things. I find um, the term black in this case and arguing these issues um, biologically and scientifically inaccurate. And mm -hmm. they don't really work. And if you want to talk about skin colors, people can be quoting all kinds of exceptions and regional issues and things like that. So I tend not to focus on skin color at all. And there are ways that uh, people, once again, can use the evidence to argue for one side or for the other. And I'll give you an example. There's a Middle Kingdom statue uh, found at Thebes where the skin color of the king, he's sitting there in a white uh, sort of uh, ceremonial garment, and he's got very black painted skin. And an Afrocentrist interpretation would say, see, the Egyptians were black Africans. Here is the proof right here. Uh, another argument could be, though, that there is a symbolism to colors. The desert was known as red and the arable land was known as black, the black land where the inundation would kick up all of this fresh alluvial soil again. And that becomes symbolic for regeneration and, and resurrection, the god Osiris, for example. And so you could look at the color that that statue was painted as an indication of fertility and regeneration and and rejuvenation and not mm. an attempt to biologically represent an actual skin color. Looking at tomb paintings and colors on walls, I find that a very inaccurate way to, to make these cases. So I would say kudos if you're going to, to err or focus in one direction or another, you know, black blackwashing versus whitewashing, I would commend the Assassin's Creed folks for, uh, you know, leaning more towards a, a darker skinned people, but mm -hmm. are not qualified as, uh, you know, bioarchaeologists, for example, or forensic archaeologists to talk about skin colors and races and, you know, Egyptian versus Nubians versus Libyans and, and things. It's, it's not an argument that uh, means a lot for me. I'm much more focused on the achievements of these peoples. Fair enough. Uh, so I'm going to bring you back to an area that you're probably more comfortable with, uh, and that's the Giza Pyramid Complex. Mm. Uh, and so unsurprisingly, this forms a central location for much of the action mm. in Assassin's Creed Origins. Yeah. Uh, players, for instance, are encouraged to explore this complex and journey inside the tombs to find treasure. And there's almost too much to talk about with regard to Giza, but could you give us a brief background on the purpose and the development of this complex? Sure. Well, it goes through several different ages. I'd say the most important one is back in the Old Kingdom or Pyramid Age, of course, and that's Dynasty IV. And you have three royal tomb complexes there built by Khufu, that's the Great Pyramid, sometimes called Cheops, second one by Khafre, sometimes called Kefren, and the third one by Menkaure, sometimes called Mycerinus. So they are three, not all, but three of the kings of Dynasty IV. And Khufu chose this plateau, this limestone plateau with different geological member formations sloping down to one angle as the place to not only build his pyramid, but lay out a cemetery of elite administrators on one side and royal family members on the other side. And those are those rectangular little um, superstructures that you see. They're called mastabas. That's an Arabic word for bench because of the shape of these tombs. And so each of the royal pyramids doesn't just stand alone, but it's part of a, a large mortuary complex. You have the pyramid as the burial place for the king. Then on the east side, you have a pyramid or upper temple 
And that connects to a long causeway or passageway that goes eastwards down towards the Nile Valley and ends in a lower temple or what's called a valley temple. These are all built for the funeral procession and funerary rites. And you have to remember that after the kings die, people don't just walk away and there's nobody there. There's a mortuary cult that continues for all eternity. And that means produce has to be grown and brought and offering spells have to be said and rituals have to be performed. And so this isn't just a quiet old cemetery out in the desert west of modern Cairo. This is a living, breathing mortuary establishment with with rounds and duties and produce and priests and repeating rituals and all kinds of activity going on. So those are the three pyramids. And then even after the kings in later dynasties move away from Giza and start building their pyramids at other places, such as Abu Sir and Saqqara further to the south, the high officials keep on building at Giza. They move too, but there are still many high officials building their mastaba tombs at Giza in dynasties five and six. And in fact, some of the cemeteries then get choked full of subsidiary and minor tombs filling up the streets <laughs> in between the, the rows of these beautiful ordered laid out uh, tombs that Khufu originally built. And in fact, behind the Sphinx, west of the Sphinx, is the original quarry zone where the core blocks used to build Khufu's pyramid were quarried from. And after his pyramid was done, that area was used as another cemetery. And so tombs began to fill that up. Some of them built up and others cut into the remaining cliff faces after the quarry ceased being a quarry. So um, it's a really complex place. There are hundreds and hundreds of burials, unbelievable site of excavations, first by um, the Harvard University Boston Museum of Fine Arts expedition, under George Reisner, and then other expeditions that worked there uh, was an Italian mission for a short time, and then a German and German-Austrian expedition and an Egyptian expedition. And there have been many others since that time, but the big three more or less divided up the whole site, and to them we owe um, what we know about Giza and some of the greatest objects and statuary ever found. Mm -hmm. Now, in the Egyptian Museum Cairo, the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, the Peabody Museum at, at Harvard University, and soon, moving from the Egyptian Museum to the new Grand Egyptian Museum, opening in part this year, just a, about a mile north of the pyramids themselves. And, and I mean, why I mean, was, why Giza, was Giza, chosen Giza chosen as a site for these pyramids? Was it uh, was the site itself just ideal for building these structures, or was there some more religious significance to this site? Mm. Well, the capital at this time is at Memphis, which is southwest of modern Cairo. And the Nile was flowing in a different location from where it flows now. It was further to the west. So it was easier to transport blocks when the Nile was in flood and get them closer to the Giza Plateau than it seems today. Today, it would be a much harder task. Um, and then it's this wonderful limestone promontory overlooking the Memphite capital and the apex of the Nile Delta and was probably a good strategic northerly location. There is some evidence that there were buildings of some kinds before Khufu got there, and he must have done some kind of eminent domain action to clear things out <laughs> and start building the, uh, the cemeteries the way he wanted them. But it became a very important place. And then after the Old Kingdom, it's not used so much, but it gets a sort of second life and even third and fourth lives in the New Kingdom. And New Kingdom pharaohs come, and they like to ride their chariots around the site and sort of visit it like a thousand-year-old tourist attraction. And some of them erect temples oriented to the Sphinx and put up steely, talking about romantic tales about how they got the kingship thanks to the Sphinx and lots of other things. So there's a new kingdom sort of reanimation of the place. And then even a late period reanimation when some of the tombs get reused and you get late period burials. So new kingdom would be, say, 1500, 1400 BC and late period, say, around 600 BC or so. And then there are even uh, Roman period restorations to some of the Sphinx's paws, for example, and and other areas. So it does have quite a long life. And then it's the beginning of the 1900s when the great AD, that is, when the great uh, archaeological expeditions set up camp and start documenting their finds and working responsibly. That's the real advantage. Mm -hmm. Welcome to Mered's Wares, traveler. Well, what do you think? junk. So speaking of tourist traps, uh, one of the interesting aspects of the Giza depicted in Assassin's Creed Origins is that it's the site of a Ptolemaic era tourist right. trap. Right. And you've got Ptolemaic vendors uh, who set up shop near the Great Sphinx. 
and they hawk their wares of replica tomb artifacts. Mm -hmm. uh, similarly, uh, there is a Greek and Roman obsession with the location and contents of Alexander the Great's tomb. And I'm wondering, to what extent were people in the Ptolemaic era, uh, or maybe even earlier, interested in the tombs uh, and the pyramid structures from earlier kingdoms? And if there were, if there was interest, uh, to what extent did it resemble the historical tourism that we see today? Mm, I think it would be a little different. In some cases, you might think of it more as um, pilgrimage sites. So as I mentioned before, in the New Kingdom, you do have people returning to Giza, and sometimes they'll leave graffiti at these places, giving their name, maybe a date, and that they visited these august noble monuments from the past. We have king lists from various monuments, so you know that the Egyptians did keep some kind of archival records through the dynasties and through the names of kings. They knew who Khufu was, and they knew who Khafre and Menkare were, and so um, that's, that's in their consciousness. The fun story about um, the New Kingdom is one pharaoh that we've been working on recently at the Harvard Semitic Museum. This is the young prince who becomes Thutmose IV in the 18th dynasty, so around 1400 or so BC. And his father used to ride around um, the site, and he loved Giza, and he built a temple there and set up a stela. Well, the son, young prince Thutmose, who may not have been the main one intended for the throne, goes to Giza as well, and he takes a nap right when the sun is at its uh, high point and in the shadow of the Sphinx. And the Sphinx is probably all buried up to its neck in sand. And apparently the Sphinx, which is associated with the sun god, appears to him in this dream and basically says, if you'll dig me out, I will help make you king. And that's what happens. So Thutmose the fourth actually becomes pharaoh. And in his first year, he reuses a piece of granite from Khafre's pyramid complex and sets it up right between the paws of the Sphinx and narrates this wonderful romantic and, of course, propagandistic story about his <laughs> legitimacy to be on the throne. The reason I'm interested in that right now is we found a way to use an old plaster cast mold of that um, stela and uh, create a new fabricated full-size um, copy in modern resins, which we've colored so they look like the actual pink granite of the original stone. Mm. And in some cases, that plaster cast preserves more of the hieroglyphic text because it was made in the 1840s than is still preserved on the real stela between the Sphinx's paws. So we'll be setting that up in the Harvard Semitic Museum in the next few weeks, and we'll add to it an augmented reality exhibit so that you'll be able to see it in context with the Sphinx appearing and you can walk all around it or stand between the paws and hold your phone up in 360 degrees and see translations of the text and things. So we're excited to uh, to experiment with this blending of, of ancient and modern technology. Wow, great plug. Um, so I'm wondering, you know, you talked about how these, uh, these pyramid sites, these cemeteries were not, you know, kind of left alone, but in fact, you know, had people going in and out of them. Uh, over the course of centuries. And I'm wondering, you know, what type of people had access to the inside of these tombs? Um, you know, because one of the things that you see during the game is uh, that several of the tombs and cemeteries have been kind of ravaged over and your uh, uh, player character, Bayek, is very upset by this, that uh, people right. are properly managing uh, mm -hmm. these leftover tombs. So I'm wondering what happens to that tomb maintenance process? Yeah, great uh, question. I think forward. that... One of the $64,000 questions in Egyptology is the mortuary cult of a deceased Egyptian. You know, it's supposed to happen forever. There are scenes and inscriptions on the tomb wall, offerings represented, spells that have to be said, produce that's meant to be brought in by priests and laid down on offering tables and things. This is supposed to happen forever, but of course it never did. People fall from favor. People die too young and their tombs don't get finished. People's families might move away and can't uh, take care of the cult anymore. Or then you get the willful actions where tombs are partially dismantled or usurped or uh, names and titles are hacked out or repurposed. They're recarved with somebody else's name, and then he gets all the magical beneficence from having that tomb. So all of these things are possible, and trying to figure out the life of these monuments after the death of the tomb owner is a great, great challenge. You know, did it happen for one year in one case? And 10 generations in another case, you know, how long do these mortuary cults continue? And a private or a non-royal mortuary cult is probably different from a royal one mm -hmm. in terms of resources and things and longevity. But eventually they all die out. And then in terms of who's supposed to be where, 
Well, underneath these tombs, you have a burial shaft and a burial chamber, and that's where the sarcophagus and the mummy would go. And nobody's supposed to go down there again after the burial. But above ground, you end up with a system of offering chapels and what's called a false door. That's kind of the nexus point between the land of the living and the land of the dead. So the living would actually bring their produce. The priests would come in, and often the son is acting as a kind of mortuary priest for a deceased father, brings in the offerings, says a particular spell, deposits these offerings of bread and beer and cuts of meat and, and wine and milk and things on the offering table in front of this false door, says the spells, and the spirit of the deceased magically comes through this door and partakes. And then later the food is probably taken out again and distributed among people employed to service that cult. So when those things break down, when chapels get sanded up or blocks get quarried off because, you know, they're ready-made quarry stone, why go to the quarry when you can just take that, <laughs> that other guy's blocks because his family's gone, you know, they moved away or they've died out, no one's going to know. Um, but these are great questions. How was the necropolis managed? You know, when would you get in trouble? Where are you not supposed to go? Mm-hmm. When the king is having his uh, reanimation ceremonies over his mummy before he's buried, who's invited? Is it just the royal family? Is it a bunch of priests? Is it the Memphite court? You know, do all the regular Egyptians, are they not even allowed up on the plateau? Or do they have to stay outside the temple or the purification tent or wherever these rituals are happening? We don't know those things, and it would be great to find out. Mm. So uh, here we are talking about a, a virtual reconstruction of the Egyptian past. But at Harvard, you're working on the Giza project, uh, which is creating its own virtual reconstructions of Egypt's past. And I was wondering if you could tell the audience a bit about that project. Sure. So we were blessed by having a man named George Reisner, who ran the Harvard University Boston Museum of Fine Arts Expedition. And he worked for about 40 years living in Egypt and Sudan just about all the time and only coming back to Harvard to teach a few semesters and to be the curator at the Museum of Fine Arts. And he worked at 23 different archaeological sites up and down the Nile in Egypt and Sudan. But Giza was the main one. And the camp there was called Harvard Camp. And everything went through there. And that's where he spent most of his time. And because he was one of the founding fathers of modern archaeology, that meant he was meticulous about his documentation. So thanks to him, it isn't just, well, we don't know where this statue came from, but rather we have thousands upon thousands of glass plate negatives and diary entries and register books and numbering systems and plans and sections and manuscripts and publications. And so back in 2000, we were lucky to get some grants at the Museum of Fine Arts, where I worked at the time from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. And so I thought, let's take Giza and try to holistically scan and link and database everything and get it up online so that you can say, I'm interested in tomb number 10. And the system would spew back to you, well, we have 50 photos and 13 articles and 12 drawings and three statues, and they're in these museums over here. And it would unite everything so you could then study the site tomb by tomb by tomb. And once we moved to Harvard in uh, about 2011, we had also embarked on 3D modeling of the site with a company in Paris called Dasso System, and we've built a lot of the major monuments already. It's always interesting to teach with those monuments and then compare what Assassin's Creed has done. Obviously, <laughs> the budget and the hundreds of computer graphics artists and things like that. But we're trying to base what we do on sound archaeology and actual documentation, and so I think that's where, uh, you know, where we have a bit of a leg up uh, on that score. So, uh, so it's an ongoing project. There's always more data to add, more collections from around the world to uh, keep, and then to try to use the 3D modeling in an immersive and interactive way so that you can fly over the pyramids, become interested in a tomb, dive down, go into the chapel, click on a wall and get the translation, go into a room and say, well, what was found here? And, you know, digitally repatriate the statues that might have been excavated in 1907 from that room or so. It's an endless task, and uh, we have a long way to go, but uh, it's tremendous potential. And with all the new technologies coming along, there's always uh, something new to try. Right. That sounds amazing. And, you know, speaking as a scholar, I mean, what do you think the utility is of this kind of digital technology for your own work, uh, for your scholarly work? Because I can see the utility for, say, somebody who has a passing interest uh, in Giza and being able to see uh, the inside of these tombs. But I'm just wondering, you know, from your scholarly perspective, what do you make of this technology? Right. Well, our project started just doing the areas dug by our own expedition. And then I realized, how do you study the site holistically if you don't know what the Germans dug or the Egyptians dug? So we try to include everything now and, uh, and 
take the site in a, in a holistic fashion. It's a great teaching tool, but it also lets you ask research questions because you're now having to think about, well, how do I restore that wall? And what were those ancient colors? And how do I flag the difference between what was archeologically attested and what I'm speculating about? How do I make that clear? And we need standards. We, um, in one case, simulated the, the direction or the angle of the sunlight coming through the window of a tomb. And it looked like it actually was shining across the tomb chamber and illuminating one of these holy places, one of these so-called false doors. Mm. And that's something that wouldn't have been possible without this kind of simulation. And even further, it also raised questions about, well, what were the buildings outside and next door to this tomb? And would they have blocked the sunlight? And if so, if sunlight is so important, does that tell us the chronological sequence? That other building wasn't there originally, so the sunlight wasn't blocked. Now it's blocking the sun, so that means it must have come later. So interesting questions and answers can come up as, uh, as a result of all of this. Mm. And I, I teach my classes at Harvard in a visualization lab with a big screen and 3D glasses and so um, this gives the students a kind of an immersive experience for the monumentality of Giza that I don't think they'd get in other ways. And uh, who knows, we may even show a few clips from Assassin's Creed in there when the, when the educational version comes out without all the killing. Well, it just so happens that that educational version comes out next week on right. Tuesday. So mm-hmm. I'll see if I can twist your arm to maybe look at some more footage right. of the see game. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, I think... That's all the time we have for today's episode. Peter, thank you so much for joining me. Great pleasure, Bob. Nice to talk with you. Thanks very much. If you enjoyed this episode of History Respond, please consider contributing to our Patreon campaign by going to patreon.com forward slash history respond. Until next time, goodbye.